So I want to point out that the information that I'm going to provide here is uh, partially gleaned from Edgar Casey readings and partially gleaned from my own experiences. And a few years ago, I was drawn to do what the Lakota and Hopi refer to as vision questing. I was living in Africa. I lived outside the United States for 33 years. I lived nine years in South America, one year in India, seven years in Africa, uh, in, spent a lot of time in the Middle East and in Scotland. And while I was living in Africa, I started having dreams about a Native American shaman coming to me and telling me I needed to do a vision quest. I didn't know what a vision quest was. And I began lightly researching it. And in 1998, I decided to move forward with that. And I went through an experience for seven years of fasting for five days. I'm a big person, and I knew that a three-day fast wasn't enough for me. In fact, I, when I started doing the vision questing, I didn't even feel hungry for three days. That's how much <laughs> excess weight I was carrying. But I did my first vision quest in the Red Rock National Forest. Uh, and nothing happened other than the fact that I began with a sweat lodge, fasted for five days, and ended with a sweat lodge. But it felt good. It felt like I was on the right path to something. And I was invited by the shaman to come back and complete the four-year cycle. And he told me that you, if you accept to do this, you need to complete four years, and you need to do it once a year. And the process was that you took sacred tobacco as a sacrament and put it inside a cloth and say a prayer on it, tie it in that cloth on what they call a prayer tie, and you do 440 of these to prepare for the vision quest. And you also fast during this process. So at the time, I was still working as an engineer. I took uh, 10 days of vacation. And I began making the prayer ties. F I had to cut 444 squares of cloth into four sacred colors, put tobacco in them, and say a prayer, either for something I wanted to achieve or for forgiveness or, or for someone else to have a healing. And after I have big, fat fingers, and after tying 444 of these together, which took me about 18 hours, I had this big pile of thin rope, and when Yellowbird came to me and told me to put them in a circle, they were all tangled up. And I said, well, I'm going to have to cut the string and tie them together, otherwise it's going to take me hours to untangle them. And he said, no, you can't do that. And so I, it took me another six or seven hours to untangle them, and the rope at that time was probably 150 feet long, but I put them in a circle. And it was frustrating, and I said, Yellowbird, I said, you know, I'm really just coming here to fast, and I know you have your own particular beliefs, but I'm really just wanting you to supervise me in a fast. And he goes, well, this is the way the ancestors do it, and this is where my energy comes from, and you have to follow this procedure. So I did, and I put the uh, prayer ties in a circle, and we uh, denoted the directions with cairns of rocks and tobacco offerings and cloth, I went inside, and I was not able to enter, leave that circle until after we were finished. And three days in, I understood why I had needed to make the prayer ties. Once you go without food for a number of days, your body cleanses itself, and you begin to reach altered states of consciousness. When you go into altered states of consciousness, there is a certain vulnerability. There is a certain situation in which fear can come in. And because I had made these prayer ties and put in that energy of protection, and because he had circled with white sage uh, and came through three or, three or four times a day, I felt safe within that space. Nothing happened during my first vision quest, but I felt 
I was on the right track for something. So I came back the second year and I went to the Yaqui Reservation in Tecate, Mexico. And that's where I met, after I finished, Don Gennaro, who is a very famous Yaqui medicine shaman. Nothing happened. On the second day of my quest in Mexico, a windstorm started. 50, 60 mile an hour winds, and it was in a dust bowl bearing place. I was completely covered in dust, my mouth, my eyes, and I almost quit. I almost thought this is just too much, but I persevered. Not much happened other than I had time to really think, and a lot of my thoughts were devoted to where I was in my life. Is this really what I wanted to do in my life? And by that time, I had been in the engineering profession um, for over 20 years. And I finished the vision quest and again, did not have a vision, but I had a lot of self-search. The third year I went back and it was in December and we went to Red Rock National Forest. And the reason I always did these in December is because my job was very demanding and people were always looking for me at that time. And so I would book my vacation time around the 14th of December because people would break off for Christmas and I could explain why I wasn't available. And what also was an, a cosmic wink is the seven days ending after the 14th was the December 21st solstice. So we went to Sedona, Arizona to Red Rock National Forest to a place called Shaman's Dome. And I built, built my prayer ties, put my sl had a sleeping bag, went inside. There's no water for the first three days. You get water and you get a type of herbal tea that tastes a bit like mud uh, if when the shaman brings it to you. And, uh, and no food for the entire time. And on my third night there, it started snowing. Sedona is about the same elevation as Denver, not quite and it got really cold. It was getting down to 14, 15 degrees Fahrenheit, about 10 degrees negative, 10 degrees centigrade, and it was really cold. And I was laying there on the ground thinking, what in the world am I doing? I've done this for th three years now, nothing's happened. Why am I doing this? And I got under the sleeping bag, really cold, and when the sun started coming up in the morning, I was so happy. It brought a bit of warmth. And it's interesting in Sedona, in that area of Arizona, which is the high plains, you can have the daytime temperature get up around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and, and then it get w way cold at night. So the sun felt good in my face. And I pulled my knees up, put my arms around my knees, put my shoes on. And I opened my eyes, and in front of me was sitting a Native American shaman. I can see his face now, I'm getting goosebumps. He had raven black hair, a regal face, high cheekbones, and he had a small red feather in his hair. And he told me his name was Red Feather. And he, and I closed my eyes again and thought, oh my God, I'm having a vision. <laughs> And I opened my eyes again, and he was still there. And it was a breakthrough for me because uh, in my youth, I had experienced, and I, I played basketball on a, on a scholarship. Uh, you heard uh, Scott Walter talk, he played football in college. I played basketball. And so I never drank, never did anything like that. But when I was in my mid-twenties, I had tried LSD a few times, not recreationally, but I had tried it. And uh, outside of that, when I had an engineering job, they had s drug testing and all of that, so I was pretty clean. And I was having a, hallucina a, a, a hallucination type experience, but it had a, v a validity to it. I was communicating with Red Feather, and he told me to stand up, and I said, well, I'm waiting for Yellowbird, and, and this was all telepathic. And he said, no, come with me, and so I walked out of the circle, and we were walking toward the top of Shaman's Dome. 
And at that time, we were at a high spot, and I could see Yellowbird coming out up in his old truck, maybe a mile away. And Yellowbird actually pulled over and went outside, and it's a, it's a landscape of rock where sound carries. And he got out, took his drum, and started singing the visioning song as if he was aware that I was finally having that vision. And it was powerful. And I walked with Red Feather up to the top of Shaman's Dome, and then immediately I'm flying over Red Rock National Forest. And I'm seeing things in 3D. I'm seeing people turn their lights on. I'm seeing cars starting to go to work in the morning. And it was a phenomenal experience. It showed me that there is another dimension of reality. And when Yellowbird arrived at the scene and he came up on top of the rock, there were six inches of snow on the ground. And Yellowbird had a snake skin and he said this is powerful this is winter snakes are in hibernation and when he was coming across to the site a rattlesnake had moved across the path and he had he tried to avoid it he ran over it and then it ran over its head in his old truck and killed it and he skinned it and brought it to me as a gift of the vision because the snake represents change in Lakota belief. They change their skin every year. And he said, you've made a big breakthrough. And I still have that snake skin that I have as a hat band and the rattles. And that was a powerful experience. Things that uh, on the one hand you might say were a result of hallucinations from fasting, but there was a validity to it. There was a meaningfulness to it. And this was my third day, and in the fourth day, I, I, he took me down into a cave called Shaman's Cave. And I had incredible visions and was out of my body. And I was told then that I needed to complete the other three vision quests, and then I needed to go to South America to do shamanic visioning, which I did. I was in La Paz, Bolivia, as a geologist, and I had met a Peruvian shaman that offered ayahuasca. And so I, and, and you have to realize that in Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia, you have a majority population of indigenous. And so ayahuasca is not illegal, it is considered a sacrament. So I walked into a tourist agency to book a flight to Peru. And I said, I want to do the Vuelo de Condor, which is the flight of the condor, meaning the ayahuasca. And she says, well, you're going to have to fly from La Paz to Buenos Aires and Buenos Aires to Lima and then Lima to Puno. And it's going to take a day and a half. And, she s and I said, oh, gosh, you know, that's a, I don't have that much time. And she said, well, there is a shaman here that does the Vuelo de Condor. And she gave me his phone number. And I called him. And his name was Miguel. And I said my name and that I wanted to do the flight of the condor. And he said, how did you get my phone number? This is a new cell number, and I've not given it to anyone. And I said, well, this lady at the travel agent gave it. And he, gets, and he was confused by that. And I told him what I wanted to do, and he said, well, you know, we don't do it for one person, and I would have to meet you. It's not for everyone. And so we talked a little bit, and he said, well, I'm going to have to think about it. And then I called him back in an hour, as we had arranged, and he said, what are you doing down here? And I s told him. And he said, what company do you work for? And I told him. And he goes, my college, he, he had actually, then he switched to English. He had actually been educated in the United States as an uh, anthropologist. And he said, well, my college roommate works for that company. And as it turned out, his college roommate was our vice president of human affairs. And so with that connection, he agreed to do the medicine. And I went to his retreat at 17,000 feet in La Paz and had one of the most amazing experiences of my life. I, I was alone in the Kiva. And when he gave me the ayahuasca, it was a small glass. And I really wanted to have a powerful experience. And so I waited about 30 minutes. Not much happened. And I went back and I said, Miguel, nothing's happening. Can I have another glass? And he said, that's powerful stuff. Are you sure? And I said, yes. 
And I took it and whoa. About, about 15 minutes later, the best way I can describe this experience, I'm going down a roller coaster at 2,000 miles per hour and below me is the abyss. And if I fall out, I'm lost forever. And I was just, oh my God, what have I done? And I'm holding on and I'm holding on. And then it leveled out. And this experience is personal. And a lot of the visions that I have, I'm going to share with you in a short matrix. But at one point, Miguel came to me and he blew Amazonian smoke into my chest and he said, calm down. He said, you can clear 10 lifetimes tonight if you work. He said, don't quit work. And I suddenly was taken to this place that was covered in vines and these men wearing strange green hats m came up to me and asked me if I wanted to enter into this space and I did and I went in and I had a review of my life and every person I had ever hurt I felt it from their perspective and I asked for their forgiveness, and I would release it, regurgitation of energy. Like, how many of you have seen The Green Mile, that movie? And when the guy's in the jail and those bees come out of there, that's what it was like. Originally, it contained liquid, and at one point into the night, it was dry, but it was coming out. And I went through my entire life, and everyone that had ever hurt me, I faced them, and I released the hurt, and we talked about it. And I was so far into that that I forgot that this was James sitting on a mountain in Bolivia having taken this, this uh, medicine. I was in that place for 50 years. And when I came back down, I was so happy to realize that I was still alive. And that experience that might be akin to what the Christians would call the afterlife judgment was so real that for weeks afterward, I was calling up people and apologizing for things I had done 30 years before. And I was determined to put my life on track. And it was a powerful, powerful experience. But, but before I got into that place, there was a place that I got to that after, right after the experience of the roller coaster, where I felt scared. And it was what they say in Spanish, the campo de medio, the field of fear. And I had to overcome that fear. And it was a blockage of the ego because to go into that higher dimension, my ego had to die. And so what I had in that experience, I'm going to relate to here, it was like death. The ego is necessary for survival, but to go beyond it, it has to go to sleep and it doesn't want to go to sleep. And so the fear was there. I had to willpower past it. And when I got to that other side, I was no longer me. It was like there was a narrator that was higher than me. And I hope this makes sense to you in the terms that I'm saying. I was more than me. And I knew that it was similar to the death experience, that when we pass to that other side, we become a collective of all we've ever been and we released those fears. And I had some incredible experiences after the judgment part, where I was in three places at one time. In one place, I was in a massive temple, giant columns, and I'm hiding behind and looking up, and there is a chair with a giant elephant sitting in it. I didn't even at that time know who Lord Ganesh was. But I was like the mouse looking up at him, and I could hear sitar music. And he was a giant. He was massive. And he told me he was going to help me remove obstacles. And that's all I really remember, except that it was so powerful. And to this day now, I have statues of Ganesh in my, in my home. And he is a powerful, powerful being. And at the same time, in another realm, I'm on a spaceship being shown around a Syrian Pleiadian craft. And the beings on there are very thin, and the person showing me around was another version of me, except a lot thinner. 
And I could go on and on, but what it did is it took me into the after-death realm. And so I'm going to share a little bit in this presentation. And I've done since then ayahuasca a number of times. In fact, next year we're leading a pilgrimage to Peru, and we're offering that option. And I'll talk about that perhaps tomorrow. But I did ayahuasca another eight times after that. I was called to go back, and each time I prepared for it. It's not fun. There is no way it can be recreational. You have to brace yourself for it. You see the dimension of truth. You see what I think happens when you die. You see every aspect of yourself that does not serve your higher purpose, and it hurts. When you see the pain you have caused others, it is searingly painful because you feel it from their side. And you understand the priorities of what really matters in life. And so I want to talk now a little bit about what I think happens when we die. And the first thing that, of course, we want to say is that death does not exist. And I want to read a couple of uh, quotations here. And this is actually from a Metatronic channel. And it was through Ayahuasca that I first encountered Metatron. And I'll talk about that a little later. But, uh, you know, we talk about the existence of extraterrestrials, of consciousness. This was probably, outside of the experience with Red Feather, the most powerful experience I ever had. But I did encounter angelic beings on that other side. There is no fatalistic end with a final judgment resulting in eternal, eternal reward or eternal punishment. In fact, there is no end. Life is ever expanding. Death is not a fearful experience to dread. Physical passing is a rebirth into your greater reality and in many ways is quite an exquisitely beautiful awakening. In truth, birth into the physical realm is far more traumatic than a return to the angelic realm. Passing from physical may be appropriately described as coming home, and it is an expansive transition. Certain extraordinary expansions of reality are innate to being in a far wider horizons, which offer much greater sensitivities and understanding. Physical death is a natural transition into the spiral wheel of consciousness. And as I say, the ayahuasca differs in certain way from what I consider the death experience to be. And I have talked to several people that have had near-death experiences. And so I want to talk a little bit about what I think people were experience when they exit the body. Death is not at all a fearful experience as verified by many who have had near-death experiences. In fact, birth is far more challenging to reenter. To re and this is from Edgar Casey reading 294114. Death is not at all what most people think. It is not at all a horrible or fearful experience. It is simply a change. Now, at the moment of your passing, at the moment of your physical death, your spiritual essence exits the physical body and enters your etheric form. In some circumstances, you will actually float above your physical body and view the room below. How many of you have had out-of-body experiences in which you view yourself? When I did the fasting in Red Rock National Forest in Sedona, the first part of my body when I was flying over and still seeing things in 3D. In that first part, I did stay in 3D. The second part in the cave, and that's interesting what Robert Schock mentioned about the uh, Schumann resonance uh, in, in cave scenarios being more pure and allowing for altered states. But when I was in the cave, when I was in the top of Shaman's Dome, I was able to see myself sitting on that uh, cliff face of the dome and I was far above it. And when I was in the cave, I went into an entirely different realm. And each level that I would pass through had geometric forms. When I was a young boy, I was born into a very 
staunchly religious Protestant family. We went to church every time the doors were open. And um, at night, when I was up until about the age of six, when I would lay down to go to sleep, I would look up on the ceiling and see these geometric forms come and just start floating around. And then I'd, like someone counting sheep, I would finally go to sleep. Well, each time that I have done the visionary experiences, whether it is through f pure fasting or through the lens of ayahuasca, there are geometric doors that I pass through to go to each level. Within the first minutes of death, the soul essence senses a light expansion, an awakening. There is, in most cases, an immediate surge of consciousness, but variation can occur depending on the manner of one's passing. If someone is ill, if someone is of senior age in which we anticipate a death, in a certain way, death is more expected and is easier to, uh, to accept. But when there are unanticipated deaths, such as accidents, uh, someone young passing over unexpectedly, there can be certain levels of confusion. And I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Now, there are in certain situations deaths that occur with people that are unwilling to let go of life. If you are a person, that is very, very wealthy, that is very, very powerful, that has a strong ego attached to the, a particular lifetime, it may be very hard to let go. If you are a person that is working on a project and you pass before it's finished, you may actually stay back and try to finish that project. And what happens on the other side is that there is an inverse of space and time. On the other side, there is no time. Time is fixed. And in a manner of speaking, space is fluid. On this side of the veil, space is fixed and time flows. So it is a torus. It is the snake eating its own tail as shown in Tibetan Buddhism. It is the wheel of time. It is the torus. There is a place and there is a theory that was put forward by Dr. J. Alford that it Planck's number, and I'll, that's a completely different presentation, space and time merge into this fog and then they solidify in the after realm of the, uh, of the Taurus. But when you first die, you may feel you suddenly that you're in multi places at once. You will discover that when you think of a person, suddenly you're there. When you think of a place, suddenly you're there. So you need to realize that physics on the other side are mental. You're in a realm of mental physics. When you think of a place, you're there. And you can be in multi places at once. And you may get tossed around a little bit, confused at what's happening until you learn to navigate it. Now, if you understand that these things are happening, if you are an evolved soul, death can be smoother. Interestingly enough, death is very difficult for people who are materialistic. Graham, was it Dawkins you said that uh, Richard Dawkins is author of The Selfish Gene, is a British um, academic who says that when we die, that's it. Nothing else exists. There are a lot of people who believe there is no afterlife. And when people believe that very strongly and they pass to the other side, they have one of the most difficult transitions uh, that anyone can have because they're so believed there's nothing there. It takes them a long time before they know where they are. They, uh, they may be in this horrible place where they can't get out of and their beliefs are so strong that they don't allow themselves to float higher, don't allow themselves to float into the light. Now this is interesting too. 
if you are a devout Christian, devout Hindu, devout Muslim, devout Jew, if you are a strong, borderline, zealotry believer of what's going to happen according to the text when you pass over, with the exception of Buddhism, um, you may hallucinate those things. If you're a strong Christian and you believe you're going to go to the gates, the pearly gates, and be met by St. Peter, uh, you may hallucinate that. But it's short-lived. And in time, the reality will come to you. Again, if you're an agnostic and believe nothing's going to happen, you may have help. But there is help on the other side. There are mediators, very often people who are still alive, who work with those that are transitioning. These are advanced souls. And generally, the ones that do work on this, in this capacity are more able to help the people that are passing over. Most people that are aware of what is going to happen can have the smoother transitions. People who pass unexpectedly may not realize they are dead and can go into a confused, dreamlike state. How many of you have ever been to a Civil War battlefield? My wife and I went to one, and Anne is incredibly psychic. She, her entire family are psychic. Uh, her family was split into halves in the sense that in Scotland, the more accomplished, quote unquote, side of her family looked down on the ones that had the psychic gifts. She had an aunt called Aunt Betty that was a very famous psychic, and the rest of the family called her the Gypsy. And uh, she actually gave Anne my initials three years before we met. But uh, Anne only knew my nickname when we met and didn't realize until after we had become a couple that those were the initials her aunt had given her. And she never told me her aunt said, watch out for that guy, stay the heck away from him. <laughs> that was 40 years ago. And, uh, but Anne has incredible abilities of out-of-body experiences as well. Her whole family, she had an uncle that was renowned as a um, telekinetic abilities, the ability to lift tables. Timelessness, back to the Civil War battlefields. I spoke about timelessness. Ann and I went to a Civil War battlefield in Arkansas. I, I was born and raised in Arkansas, and of course many of you recognize that Arkansas is considered the intellectual capital of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have a high educational process. I was taught about the Greek philosophers, Socrates. <laughs> it is an interesting area. It's a very large quartz content, and I was born into the crystals. But Ann and I went to a Civil War battlefield in uh, northwest Arkansas, and uh, she saw a young Civil War soldier walking around. And I remember it very clearly. Ann has visions of things that I don't have. And uh, his name was Danny, and he was confused, and he had just been killed, and he thought he had been there 15 minutes but it was obviously over 120 years. When you're on the other side and you get into these confused places, what happens in linear time could be decades, centuries. But your, to your cognition on that side, it just may only be moments because time does not flow. And so a lot of these sightings that you see of uh, people have been killed in a battle or these haunting things. To that other person, it just happened. One time when I was in Mount Shasta, we had a psychic uh, person that uh, said, well, we're opening a portal. There's all these trapped souls, and 150 went through. There is a lot of delusional ego among psychics, and that's something you have to be aware of. It is very easy for people to get into metaphysics and uh, develop a guru sense, a zealotry, and have to have followers. And they're actually psychic uh, vampires. They're feeding on your energy. In Mount Shasta area particularly, there was just a, a one conference I went to. There were people that were 
in an ego delusion that, that they were, you know, everywhere they went, they're releasing trap souls and all of that sort of thing. That, I don't think, is, a, is what happens. Uh, there are certain situations where people get confused on the other side, but there are mediators. And if you are a spiritually evolved person, you will know what to do on that side. Now, there are things that you can do that help you prepare for the death experience. But let me follow through with this slide. Once the threshold is crossed, an automatic transition occurs, and one rises into a higher state of consciousness. And the higher states have many levels that correspond to dimensional fields. After death, dimensions are essentially frequential barriers that are perhaps better understood as vibrational intensities and psychological states. Now, how many are familiar with the Bardo? The Bardo, the three Bardos are a Tibetan Buddhist teaching. The Tibetan Buddhists believe that when you immediately pass over, your soul is very closely attached to the earth plane for seven seven-day periods, for 49 days. And generally, a Tibetan monk will take the text of the Tibetan Book of the Dead and read it for the pa person passing over to hear. Now, when you pass over for the first phases, you will be able to see people that are still alive, particularly people that you were closely connected to. You will be able to communicate telepathically with them. Odds are they won't recognize that that's where it's coming from. They'll just have a sense of thinking about you and think that they're just thinking of certain things. You will also quickly discover that other people don't see you, that you are a ghostly phenomenon. Most people will not see you. You will discover that you can pass through walls that you can think of when you were in high school 40 or 50 years ago and you can actually walk down the halls of your high school and watch yourself in that phase of lifetime. Others will not be able to see you, but you can relive episodes of your life. You can communicate telepathically with people and you will be able to be anywhere you think. And so it may take a little while to adjust to that. And most of that occurs during that 49 peri day period uh, called the Bardot before you pass over. Now you will have the option of passing into the higher dimension sooner. Most people talk about following this white light. And it will be interesting for you to know that most of you will be the guest of honor at your own funeral. You stay and you watch and, uh, and you gradually release the energies that bind you to earth. Have you ever noticed how the rich and famous live long lives? You know, you have these movie stars that uh, have money and have fame and, uh, you know, live into their 90s and 100s and that's because they have such an attachment to this lifetime. When you have money, when you have power, it's addicting. It is materialistic in one sense, but there is a love of life for these people that, that love their celebrity, love their fame, love, their, uh, love the money. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but if you're not a spiritual person and you pass over, you may be so attached to that life that it's hard to let go. And it is in those cases that mediators will come across and help them release. I was a foreigner for over 30 years. I never lived in an English-speaking country. I never had a great interest in watching novellas in Brazil or in, in Venezuela or Bolivia or political rallies in uh, Gabon or Congo when I lived in Africa. I didn't watch television, not because I was any particularly noble person, but because it wasn't interesting. So I read. So during my 30 years of being a foreigner, I read everything I could get my hands on. I read every book that was in the ARE library. I read all of the Lobsang Rapa material. I read all of the Seth material. I read the Koran. I read uh, the uh, Vedic text. I studied the Bible. I read everything. And had a tremendous interest in metaphysics. But so I was 
quite familiar with all the religious beliefs and the areas in which they tie over. But when you do pass over, you have the ability to connect into these other states of consciousness. Initially, you will be able to rest if rest is desired or required. The resting phase is one of great expansion in which an ambience of ecstasy occurs. Often there is a feeling of floating in a field of bright white light lined with extraordinary vivid colors. In this phase, you will be in a blissful state and adapt more easily into the understanding of the separation that has occurred. But you will still be able to focus thought to the earth plane. You will discover that thought takes you quickly to wherever and to whomever you place your focus. You may visit and comfort your family. You may visit with friends and relatives. You may revisit the past, greet childhood friends, and travel seamlessly through space and time. You may revisit your childhood, view yourself as a teenager surrounded by family, a child surrounded uh, by family at Christmas or walk down the halls of your high school as it existed decades earlier. Higher self always chooses the time. It is important to understand that no one dies without choosing to do so. The higher self ever makes the decision. Therefore, no one dies before their time. Yet there can be a sense of an unfinished life, so to speak, when the chosen life lessons selected by you for one reason or the other were not completed. In some circumstances in which one may die in a sudden unexpected situation, such as an accident in which death occurs abruptly, there can be a brief period of confusion. However, this is infrequent and usually only occurs if the person is overly attached to the physical life and cannot let go. Generally, this occurs in lesser developed souls, among those who feel they did not complete their goals or souls who became so attached to their particular lifetime experience for various reasons that they cannot accept the transition. In very rare cases, one may, after death, so firmly refuse to accept that death has occurred that they focus emotional energy toward re-entering the physical form. In other similar scenarios, one who has been obsessed with a particular goal or ongoing completing project may try to complete it for a time in a hallucinatory constructed realm before they accept and realize that their earthly sojourn has ended. But even in such extreme cases, the obvious eventually becomes clear. Navigation in the in intermediate dimensions of the non-physical realm. You may have to relearn certain laws of behavior, for you may not immediately realize the creative potency and locomotive attributes of your thoughts or emotions in the afterlife environment, environment in the immediate passing. You may be astounded to find, find yourself in five different environments simultaneously with no idea at first of the reason behind the situation. In the beginning, you may see no sequential continuity to movement and feel flung from one place to another with no rhyme or reason, quite literally shifting from one experience to another. You may not immediately realize that your thoughts are propelling you as fast as you think them. So immediately following death, there are stages of relearning navigation and adjusting to the new state of mental physics. And as I mentioned before, time and space, the torus. In 3D, space is fixed and time is moving. The reverse occurs in the higher dimension. Time is fixed, there is no time, and space is mobile, meaning that when you think of a place, you're there. Now this is interesting. Adjusting self-image. As you realize you are no longer in your physical body, you will find yourself in another form, an image that will appear physical to you, 
but you will quickly learn that you cannot operate within the physical system with it in the same way you did while you were living. The difference between your etheric body and the physical body will become obvious. As you are not seen by the living, you are ghostly, and you have the ability to pass through physical matter. Initially, you will see your physical form. You will see yourself on the other side appearing like you did in life. But you usually will choose your physical prime status. You're going to pick the way you looked in your most robust years, probably in your early 30s. But as you move higher and you float beyond the intermediate stage, you will begin to choose an image more representative of who your soul is. As you drift into plurality consciousness, you will realize that you are neither male nor female. You will realize that you are all you ever were, and you may become a photonic amalgamation of the plurality of whoever you are. And it is interesting. When I did the ayahuasca on my third experience, I became very aware of that I was not the personality aspect of who I am in this life. And in a certain way, there was a disconnection. While I was going through that life review aspect, and I was highly, highly emotionally attached to it until I released the energy. When I came back six months later and did it again, I went into experiences in which I encountered angelic beings. But I didn't feel as connected to James, to Tib, in this lifetime. I felt like I was more than that. I felt like I was a higher aspect. Isn't it interesting sometimes when even if you are aware of past life incarnations, even recent ones, you don't always feel so connected to the emotional parts of it. And you don't necessarily identify so strongly with that other lifetime because it is your personality, ego, and this one that you're, that you're focused on. But when I went across that third time in La Paz, in Bolivia, I became a higher part of myself. And I'm going to share with you some experiences that I had there that are highly personal. And again, I will be the first to admit that th this may be a personal hallucinization, but it was real to me, and it had validity. And so on that third occasion, I went to a certain level, and I saw a teacher. I saw an angelic being. And this was 2007. And it was an angelic form that had three electrons circulating almost as if it was they were juggling a ball. And the being introduced himself to me as Archangel Metatron. And my experience was that he took one of these spheres, placed it into my chest, and told me that on the level that he was, he was a step down of the higher version of Metatron. And that I would be allowed to move quickly into the higher state to get a glimpse of Lord Metatron, of the higher version. And I was wrapped, and again, this is symbolic, and it may or may not have been something that uh, had meaning other than in its, uh, an analogy or a symbol. But I was wrapped in a type of gauze, and I was shot up into this tube and brought out, and I had two people or two beings with me of light, and I saw this giant golden head that looked like the, the heads on Easter Island. And it was a shimmering gold. And it seemed like it was hundreds of feet high. The, suddenly I was inside it, and there were these gears turning. And then bands of light that were all had all these geometric shapes were shooting out of these gears through the eyes and through the mouth and through the top of the head. And I was told this was the higher form of Metatron, 
and that he was generating the geometry of universes. And what struck me was that he looked like one of those heads on Easter Island. <laughs> and then I was told that I had to go back down, that his, the energy was so powerful that it would dissolve me. And so I went back down this tube, and I was in front of uh, Archangel Metatron again. That's all I can recall from that experience, uh, other than being told that this experience with the ayahuasca was rewiring my brain and that I would be able to communicate with Archangel Metatron afterward. And it was after that that the channeling started to occur. And the channeling was not an easy thing for me because I had a reluctance to do it because I worked as an engineer. I worked in the scientific field and uh, uh, people that I worked with thought this sort of thing was crazy. My Baptist family in Arkansas are still praying for me. <laughs> and I have colleagues that I worked with as an engineer, and I, I reached a fairly uh, high position of management in the engineering company that I worked for. And, uh, you know, even the ones that I thought were friends that I shared what I do now with think it's ridiculous. So there is this situation where, uh, you know, you get into this aspect of metaphysics and, uh, part of me is more drawn to the scientific, and part of me is a little reluctant to do the uh, metaphysical channeling part, but it seems like it's valid. And so I do try to, to match the two and offer that message because one of the big dangers in metaphysics, as I mentioned before, is that people think that lofting off into the high part of it is better than being in 3D, but that's not the truth. You are here on earth as the testing ground, and that is what Casey says. You're not here to escape the earth, you're here to master the earth. And mastering the earth means that you are in the university of duality. You are in a realm of opposites, and opposites do not exist in higher dimensions. We are in a duality realm. When you are in non-polarity realms, there are no opposites. There is no freedom of choice. The angelic realm does not have free choice. They have divine will. I do not believe there is a hell. This is the testing ground. People talk about fallen angels. There is no such thing as a fallen angel. I think that there is an angelic being. I think that in a certain manner of speaking, you could say that angels hold together the laws of physics. I think that there is a conscious law of physics that people interpret as Satan. There are no demons other than the ones you create. But humans can create demons. Humans can create negative thought forms. When you think evil of someone, it goes to them and, when, and vice versa. When someone tries to control your will, tell you what to do, they're going to attach here. And if you don't know how to close it, they will be able to take your energy. You have to learn in duality there are certain rules. But there are no devils. There are no demons other than the ones that we create. There is no hellfire on the other side. You may briefly hallucinate that, but it's not there. We are here to evolve. And the earth plane is the testing ground. Edgar Casey, as John Van Auken mentioned briefly in his presentation yesterday, talked about us experiencing other realms or other realms of life, even while we're in this one, sometimes in sleep state, but certainly in between lives, where we go to other planets, as he mentioned, to learn aspects of consciousness. He remember him talking about Saturn, which he said was the fires where certain souls would be rebooted. And so the Earth cycle is a part of this reincarnational process. But we also go into other realms. I am aware of having a lifetime as a Syrian or having an existence as a Syrian and a Pleiadian. But they're light beings. They're not physical. They are light beings of energy and consciousness. We are here on the Earth plane to learn how to be responsible creators to learn how to be responsible creators. In my opinion, 
All of this is maya. All of this is a purposed illusion. If it didn't feel real, we wouldn't learn. If it didn't hurt at times, we wouldn't learn. But we are here to master creation, to learn how to responsibly create, because where you put your mind, you can manifest. And one of the most important things that we have to do in the era of the new earth is to be the responsible stewards of our thoughts and begin to co-create together in mass the world that we want. We are either unconscious creators of our reality or we are the conscious creators of our reality. But Earth is the testing ground. You are not here to escape the Earth. You are not on the Earth as a punishment. You are here to learn the laws of responsible creation. There are religious groups that believe that humanity has devolved and spiraled down, and certainly we are starting from scratch since the sinking of Atlantis and coming back again. But I think that 3D is a credentialed course. I think that when we complete the Earth cycle, we have the ability to move into higher realms, to other cosmos areas. Life never ends. The Christian heaven or hell, I do not believe that uh, the other side is a resting place. I think that when we go there, if we want to rest for a while, we can, but we study and we keep moving forward. There is no heaven or hell. Take a look at this one. Here's, a <laughs> Here's an imam, a priest. <laughs> We died, but at least we shall finally see which one of us was right all along. <laughs> and they're in front of Thoth. The life review. After death, all of you will have a comprehensive life review. It is extremely important and considerable time and energy will be devoted to this review. After the initial review, you will be able to choose the key parts in which to not only study, but to relive based on your discretion. In many cases, the soul will select areas in which erroneous actions were taken. You will then be guided into reviewing alternate, alternative responses to understand what could have taken place and how, and how it would have brought about an improved outcome. A deep learning occurs. This is what your religious texts refer to as the judgment. However, in this state, there are not guilt and torment. On this level, you are above the personality as you think that you're detached, and you look at it as a third-party observer to learn what actions could have taken place and have resulted in a different outcome. Now, the judgment of Matt usually occurs at what is called the second Bardo stage, seven to 12 weeks after passing in linear approximation. Again, this is based on my thinking, and uh, of course I have no way of actually truly knowing this, but this is what I have been guided, this is what I believe. Tibetan Buddhists believe that the human soul lingers between realms closely connected to the physical world for 49 days. In this timing, a monk will read from the Book of the Dead, instructing the soul on what to expect and how to move higher at completion. And these are the three stages, the Chikal Bardo, the Chanyid Bardo, and the Sidpa Bardo. And it is the third stage that the, uh, you complete taking the lessons of this lifetime and move into higher realm. Death is not an eternal resting place. There is not a heaven with streets of gold or demonic torment or a lake of fire. And there is no infinite void. Although you may briefly experience hallucinations of these if you strongly believe in them. Even so, there will be short-lived visions and there are guides to carry you into the higher realms. And I'm going to end with this slide. This is from the Casey readings, and he talks about the completion of the Earth cycle.
And we are not there in a physical form, but in a mental state. Mercury as mind and mental development. Venus, learning the nuances of love, emotion, and nurturing. Earth, the testing ground. Mars, emotional temperament, using willpower wisely. Jupiter, strength, leadership, wisdom, confidence. Saturn, spiritual purification, the crucible. Uranus, psychic, intuitive, chakric development. Neptune, esoteric studies and mystics. Pluto, mastering adversity. The moon, balancing the removal of doubt, feminine balance. Sun, vitality and spirit. Arcturus as the entry and exit point and the area of creativity. And so in closing, just remember that we are all here as students. We are all here to learn mastering responsible creation. In metaphysics, don't become airy-fairy. Don't become rose-colored glasses. We live in a true world of duality. You have to be able to relate to one another, not loft off into some isolated place and uh, meditate 24 hours a day. There is a certain aspect of that, and there may be certain lifetimes you choose for that. But you are here. Your greatest lessons are learned through relating to one another. Don't take a superior attitude. The time of the guru is past. If anyone comes to you and tells you, you need to do this or you need to do that, that's a red flag. You are your own guru. You are your own decision maker. You do not give your power away. Metatron says that for when the love of power is replaced by the power of love, humanity will make a quantum leap. When the love of power is replaced by the power of love, humanity will make a quantum leap. However, love without strength is incomplete. Strength is required to complete the university of duality, and life never ends. Thank you.